Well, one thing I want to point out here is that in giving both these arguments, I've been talking a lot about personhood. And so I want to make a distinction that philosophers often make between being a person and being a human. So here's this distinction. Being a human, and human, and I have an equal sign, DF meaning definition, have human DNA, right? So if you have, if you're biologically a human, then you're going to qualify under the term human. If you're a person, we think of personhood, philosophers treat the word personhood as something more than just being biologically human. Right? Have certain unique characters that adult humans possess, self-awareness, etc. And so the debates about whether you have a right to life, on whether abortion is immoral, all hinge on whether fetuses are persons, or potential persons, or something along those lines. How are they connected to the property of personhood? Clearly they're humans. Clearly they have human DNA. But that doesn't seem to be where moral properties arise from, moral responsibilities and rights and blameworthiness. We could, it seems like a fully functioning alien, right? A Martian who was, um, could love and feel pain and enter into relationships, have a language, a whole culture of this Martian. And they come and they visit us. Um, just because they didn't have human DNA wouldn't mean that I could torture and kill them for my own pleasure. Right? It seems that whatever moral rights arise from and moral responsibilities for how I treat things arise from, it's not just from DNA and what sort of DNA I have, but instead connects up to the fact that we have these character traits that adult humans have, right? Our free will, maybe, maybe our ability to reason, maybe our ability to be free from our desires and make decisions, make choices of our own, uh, maybe our ability to enter into long-term relationships and have long-term goals as opposed to sort of impulses of the moment. Something along those lines is what philosophers associate with personhood, and personhood is this important trait for what generates you having rights, moral rights. So you'll notice that John Scott's argument is going to be all about what makes a fetus a person, and how fetuses eventually develop to become people, and that that means they've always had the property of being a person. And that Harshman's argument is directed at the claim that all things that are persons can speak, reason, judge between right and wrong, and have personal relations. So, all of the all of the sides in the debate, everybody who's arguing about abortion, are worried about how fetuses, if fetuses count as people. No one, it's not in, no one disagrees that they're humans, but no one agree, thinks that moral uh, moral matters hinge on just having a certain DNA. Right? That seems to be some sort of weird racism um, to think that. You can mistreat someone just because they have a weird, uh, a, a certain type of DNA. Well, earlier I promised you that I would offer a response uh, to try helping respond to the objection that I had to Hartshorn's argument. So now I'm going to go ahead and discuss that. So, oops. So Hartshorn's are, are um, or not Hartshorn, I'm sorry, John Scott's argument. So John Scott, we had a problem with premise three before. Um, he said that if you had a prop, if you eventually get a property, but there's no specific point where you get that property, that means you must have had it all along. Um, we worried about that because there's lots of properties that seems to be untrue about. It, it doesn't seem like being an oak tree works that way, or being old works that way, or being rich works that way, right? Um, one day I'll eventually be old. I'll have that property. There's no specific day I got it, and yet. It's not that I've it's not that I've been old all along. So what John Scott could do is he could revive he could replace premise three with a different premise. He could say um, if something were allowed to develop and would develop into a thing that has a non gradual property p, and there's no point which it first acquires property p, then that thing has had property p from the moment it came into existence, and then he would need an additional premise that says being a person is a non gradual property. So the idea here is that some properties are gradual. Right? Being an oak tree, an, uh, an acorn turns into an oak tree, but it's a gradual process. It's not an oak tree at any specific day. Um, a poor person can become a rich person in a gradual way. I guess they could do it all at one time too, but it, for many people it's a gradual process. Being old is definitely being a gradual process. A gradual property that you don't get all at once, but eventually you, you, you get a little bit, I guess you get a little bit each day, but eventually you have it. Um, but the idea is being a person, right, ha uh, is an on-off property, right? It's either on you either have it or you don't. It's not gradual in any way. And clearly, premise three, this abstract claim he's arguing that personhood, if 
if you eventually have personhood, but there's no specific day you get it, um, that means you've had it all along. If personhood was an on-off property, like a grad, a non-gradual property, then this seems like that that seed. So now, if I'm going to object to John Scott's argument, I'm not going to object to premise two anymore or three, the, the abstract principle he's giving me, because that seems to be airtight, absolutely true. The question now is, is being per, a person a non-gradual property? Do I do I just become a person in degrees? Am I, am I is it something more like how an oak tree, an acorn turns into an oak tree, or is it something more like, I'm trying to think of a good example of an on-off property. I guess light being on, but even a light could be dimly on, but um, being alive or being dead, being conscious or being unconscious, um, being red or being, being red all over or being green all over, those would be good examples of properties which I can't have in degrees. So now the question is, now John's argument is looking a lot better just because um, being a person, uh, he, now he no longer has, he, he's no longer open to the charge that uh, he's provided us an absurd principle that says that everybody who, every child is actually old. Now he's just making the claim that um, being a person is this sort of on-off, non-gradual property. And that seems much more attractive than the previous argument he provided. Okay. Well, I, I know I'm skipping around a little bit, but earlier I just gave, um, I gave us our, argue, I talked about the distinction between being a person and being a human. I guess that these are a little out of order, but the, the, the top one just says fetuses have human DNA. All things with human DNA have a right to life. Therefore, fetuses have a right. To, that's sort of a, clearly a bad argument, right? Um, what we need is the right to life argument, like the bottom one. Fetuses are people. All people have a right to life. All fetuses have a right. So the second form of the argument where it involves personhood rather than uh, being human is clearly the better of the two. And then we've just looked at a number of arguments, John Scott's and Harshman's and how they can respond to objections about concerning premise one. Right? John Scott argued that gave us an additional argument trying to convince us of premise one. And uh, John and Harshorn gave us an argument that premise one was false. And so for this argument to succeed, we would need um, to, to endorse, believe, have reason to endorse, have reason to believe premise one. And um, clearly some that's where most debates about abortion are going to hinge on whether premise one is true of this argument. However, uh, recently there have been some, some people in support of abortion who have, who have moved the debate to a different premise. Despite the fact that most debates about abortion concern whether premise one is true or not, some have moved to attacking a different premise. Um, J.J. Thompson has a really interesting argument claiming that, uh, arguing against premise five. Now, of course, premise five, as it's stated, all killings of things that have a right to life are immoral. That's clearly false, right? We would need to have some sort of exception built in for self-defense and then just say that abortions aren't self-defense. But that doesn't seem like much of an adjustment, right? So to object to premise five on those grounds really wouldn't get anyone very far. There's a much better argument against premise five that does seem to change.